All right. Well, hello and welcome to uh, another edition of the Metal Snows webinar. Uh, wherever you're tuning in from around the world, I hope you're having a great week so far, staying safe. Uh, in this edition, we'll be discussing tips and strategies on how to keep your turf grass green throughout these hotter and uh, typically drier late, late summer months. Uh, today is a, a particularly exciting show for me, mainly because I've gotten to know one of our guests here uh, really well over the past couple months, being able to visit his research center a couple of times, see firsthand some of the things that him and his team are doing. Uh, you know, we're, we're honored to have our meadow stations set up at the William H. Daniel Turfgrass Research and Diagnostic Center at Purdue University, where Dr. Cale Bigelow teaches horticulture and is heavily involved in the uh, developing strategies for uh, better managing irrigation, fertility, and diseases in turf grass. Uh, additionally, if, if you've attended any of our webinars in the past, you know, you kind of know the format where we like to bring in a specialist to talk in depth about a particular topic, and then we bring in somebody from our team to discuss practical applications of, uh, of our technology and in, uh, in the industry. And this time we went all the way to the top. Uh, joining us is none other than the founder of, and CEO of Pestle Instruments, Gottfried Pessel. Uh, Godfrey's been personally involved with the implementation of our turf grass solutions throughout Europe, and we'll be talking a little bit about some turf specific solutions we offer under the Meadows brand, as well as uh, talking some use cases uh, throughout the field. So Godfrey, Kale, thank you so much for your time today. How are we doing? Excellent. Thanks a lot, Derek. Good afternoon. Excellent. Good evening to everybody here in the, in the in this webinar. We are really delighted to give you some insights today about uh, our, our technology. And so Godfrey, you're in the office in uh, Austria, correct? Ex yes, correct. And Kale, you're standing out in the middle of your research center, looks like in uh, West Lafayette. I'm, I'm here in West <laughs> Lafayette and yeah, that's, uh, that's some green spring grass behind me. So not all of it's that green at this point. No, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to talk about some of the, some of the drought uh, things that you're doing. And I kind of want to kick things off with you first. So let me go ahead and get your, uh, your presentation up so that we can, <coughs> are you guys seeing this? Are you seeing uh, your presentation I see, here? Yep. I see it. I see it there. I think you need to, you need to scroll back. That's not, I don't think that's the first slide. Oh, so we're, yep. Keep there going. we there go. You go. <clears throat> Boom. So one of the main things I want to dig into, and I know this is something that you're heavily involved with, uh, with, with your research is water management, you know, both for sports grass, uh, golf courses and, and lawns at home. Uh, so I know, you know, it's one of the most challenging things that we face, I think, in, you know, in the turf grass industry. So I, I've got to give the floor to you and, and let it, let, let you uh, elaborate on some of the research that you do around irrigation management. Yeah, so it's 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 become increasingly uh, a larger percentage of my time and you know mental focus as far as our, our research program. But you know we have uh, five different members of our turf team here that are on the faculty at Purdue, and uh, you know each has a different sort of research specialty. And uh, you know the the bigger areas that uh, I I tend to involve myself in is uh, species and cultivar evaluation. So what what you know, a common question for me is what's the best grass for fill in the blank. And so that might be for lawns, it might be for athletic fields, it might be for golf course uh, types of grasses. And then you start to get into practical management things. And again, you know, the, the three primary cultural practices are mowing, feeding or fertilization, and then water management or irrigation. Uh, the state of Indiana, where I live in West Lafayette, uh, we average on about on on average, we receive about depending upon where you are in the state, anywhere from 40 to 50 inches of precipitation a year. OK, so so in general, when you think of something like that and you think of, you know, the, the general textbook needs for water, you know, an inch per week, you know, 50 inches per year, you know, you should be OK in terms of. Uh, you know, supplying enough irrigation or enough rainfall that the plant is going to survive and persist from year to year. So we don't have the same kinds of issues that, you know, different parts of the United States, certainly like the, uh, the desert southwestern part of the United States where they're, you know, receiving maybe four inches per year, right? Uh, but we do run into periods, as you well know, uh, where rainfall is not evenly distributed throughout the growing season. And there are times where we might go four, six, maybe even sometimes in, in extreme situations, eight or 10 inch, eight or 10 weeks of very, very low rainfall. And that creates a lot of stress on the turf. 
Uh, and then, you know, within the segments of the, the turf industry, you know, lawns is a big, uh, is a big acreage and lawns have different expectations and different needs. And, you know, primarily when we think about lawns, we're thinking about, uh, you know, is it green and does it maintain seasonal density? When we get into recreational turf, you know, whether it's athletic fields or golf turf, uh, we start to we start to really start really start to think about things like firmness factors, you know, playability, and you know, in that kind of a situation, deficit irrigation is is usually what a turf grass manager is is aiming for because they want the surfaces as firm and fast as possible. By the same token, if I kind of bring this back to the to the lawn irrigation, probably one of the biggest things I see uh, for you know homeowners or commercial properties is excess irrigation. And to your point, I think we'll talk about this in a little bit, is this idea that, you know, when you get into excess irrigation situations where somebody's simply overwatering, uh, that creates a lot of stress on the, on the plant as well. And so, you know, really what we're trying to, trying to marry at this point is, you know, kind of bringing some of the old ideas, uh, you know, as far as uh, more data-driven approaches to irrigation that have been researched for decades and decades, but they didn't necessarily have the right tools, you know, in the 1970s and 80s when, when water became a, uh, a much bigger uh, topic that was being researched uh, throughout the United States. But now I think we really have, you know, a lot more opportunities to gather some data and, and, and almost do precision irrigation in a lot of situations. And so I'm kind of excited for, you know, number one, hopefully reducing the irrigation that's uh, applied to commercial and residential properties for lawns, but also really trying to help our professional turf grass managers that are managing, uh, you know, athletic fields and golf turf to really be able to dial in their programs and make more informed choices as far as how they want to irrigate for not only plant health, but also for playability. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, and it's something I know just even looking through my neighborhood, I mean, there's in, and if you get up uh, early enough in the morning, you can see water just rolling down the streets because everybody's it's crazy. got their sprinklers on for, you know, hours in the morning. So uh, yeah. I'll just kind of click through here. You tell me when, yeah. you, when you, yeah, want me so to... this, you know, this, this is really, you know, it was the, it was the early 2010s where, you know, I'd always been doing a kind of a little bit of work around water, you know, whether it was, you know, identifying some species that were more tolerant of, you know, summer stress conditions. Uh, I've done a fair bit of work over the years uh, with a variety of different companies that manufacture soil surfactants, which I think is a, a you know, potentially game changing tool in some situations for water management as far as trying to get uh, better water use efficiencies when irrigation is applied. But this right here was was the height of uh, you know, one of our, our more significant drought episodes uh, here in the Midwest. Uh, there's two sort of benchmark uh, drought episodes, and that would be the 1988 drought and the 2012 drought. And this really made a lot of our policymakers, uh, you know, kind of take notice of the concerns about potential water scarcity issues, uh, even in a place like the, like the Midwest that we're, where we're receiving, you know, 40 to 50 inches of rain. But this is when things were really, really, really bad. And again, as you, as you read this map, as you start to get towards the Cabernet colors or the Merlot colors, you know, if it's that time of day for you over there, Godfrey for a, a cocktail, uh, you know, th those are not good, you know, that exceptional drought. And if you were to look at the current drought monitor for, uh, 2021, you know, almost uh, the entire western part of the United, <clears throat> western part of the United States is in a severe drought uh, type of situation, and, and that that's not good for plant health, but it's also not good for many many other kinds of things. So this, uh, you know, is, is just an example, and, and they maintain this website, and you can give it a give it a look if you want to. But our our growers and our our turf managers kind of pay a little bit of attention to this because this is this kind of tells you what to predict. It also tells you you know, what's going on as far as maybe some water levels in some of our reservoirs and other things. And uh, there's, there's a lot of turf growing left. Uh, and if you don't have water at this time of the year, that's not gonna be a good thing. So what's that next slide there? Yeah, why? So we talked a little bit about this and, and why people water, you know, for the homeowner situation, the commercial property situation, the two big things that people want are greenness and density on a consistent basis throughout the growing season. They're not as worried about playability. And that's why, unfortunately, I think we see situations where things are overwatered. Again, what, how does the plant take water up? Um, assuming the plant is healthy and assuming you've got this gradient in the atmosphere, uh, obviously the plant root system is very, very uh, efficient at drawing water and nutrients out of the ground. 
uh, you know, if you have the right environmental conditions, that's, that's a big deal. And uh, as that plant, you know, pulls that water out of the ground, one of the other things that we're paying attention to uh, is evapotranspiration rates. And basically those evapotranspiration rates or, you know, the ability of water to evaporate from the plant in the soil system, uh, that's, thing, that's something that is calculated by a lot of weather stations that can then inform you about how much irrigation you possibly maybe want to apply to try and replenish some amounts that might be in the soil. So we're paying a lot of attention to that. But I also tell people a lot, uh, a lot of times about something else they need to be thinking about with this evapotranspiration piece is not only is the water, is the plant pulling in water from the soil system, the plant is also pulling in nutrients. And so when we see that seasonal greenness kind of decline in the summer months during dry conditions, uh, it's my opinion that, you know, one of the things that's also not happening there is the plant is not taking up nutrients from the soil system. And so uh, if you see your turf kind of turning off color because it's getting dry, uh, not only has it got a lack of water, but it's also got a lack of nutrients and you may need to adjust your fertilizer program or their fertilizer strategy uh, in order to maintain that greenness there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, I know that um, I had a, had a, the opportunity to come out and, and see your your turf field day in West Lafayette a couple of weeks ago, and and the particular uh, section that you and your grad assistant Jada were talking about was kind of around uh, exactly how much fertilizer to put on, and it was shockingly a lot a lot less than what I thought, and what a lot less than what I've been personally putting on, you know, even just my lawn. Uh, and I know what, I mean, watering the plant health cycle that can all kind of play a, play an impact on how much fertility you need, but it also can play an impact on which diseases are more likely to kind of creep into, creep into the ecosystem there and cause some problems, right? Absolutely. And, and, and so this is also a good point to kind of talk about, you know, our two groups of turf grass managers. So you have the, the professional lawn care managers who are really concerned about, uh, you know, color and density, right? But then you flip over to, you know, some of our professionals that are managing things at the highest level, you know, whether that's stadium fields or whether that's, you know, a high level golf course. And so they, they, they've learned over the last 10, 15 years to adjust their fertilizer practices because they want to water as little as possible to keep their surfaces as firm as possible. But by the same token, the plant still needs its nutrients. And that's, so where, that's where we get into some of these liquid or foliar feeding practices that you start to see stadium fields and, you know, golf greens and sometimes fairways and tees that will get, uh, you know, a little bit of nitrogen applied to the leaves at this time of the year because they don't want the soil to get wet because they're really trying to play for those, um, those, those firm conditions. So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting balance and it's, it's also a, a great example of the art and science of turf grass management. Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's dig a little bit into, uh, into, you know, yeah, a little bit more into, here. into lawn irrigation. And, you know, you'd mentioned that, uh, it, it, it's been taken granted for, for a while. And I know that you're, you were in a particularly interesting area of the Midwest where, uh, you know, uh, you're not off of a, a major river or canal, you know, you mm -hmm. don't have a lot of underground, uh, aquifers or anything. So, you know, in your area, particularly, I know that, uh, irrigation is a, a serious thing and, and how much can we allocate for, you know, for houses, for golf courses, for, for so on and so forth. So I'll, I'll kind of let you take the floor on that. Yeah. And, and, you know, when, when we talk agricultural scientists broadly defined, you know, we talk about these grand challenges and water is always at the top of the list. You know, we need water for food production. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about that. But when we start to think about, you know, uh, the other aspects of the human existence is, is people like green space, right? I mean, we, we, we like lawns, we like recreational places, we like, you know, some place that, that looks nice and is, is natural. We certainly have synthetic alternatives for some of our sports fields and, and even to a certain extent, some golf turf, but uh, in general, those haven't been adopted quite as well in, in, in many situations. So we're, we're always thinking about, you know, what can we do to try and use as little water as possible while still maintaining these green spaces. And to your point, you know, where West Lafayette is located, you know, we're uh, not quite equidistant between two areas that have water, you know, Lake Michigan to the north where Chicago is, and then we have the Ohio River uh, to the south of us that, um, you know, both are pretty, pretty reliable supplies of water, but where we are sort of in central Indiana between the two of those, 
we have just like that map there in 2012 shows, there are situations where water levels get to a concerning level when we start thinking about population growth, because we know that population is probably not going to go backwards unless, you know, Jeff Bezos puts us all on a spaceship and takes us <laughs> off the planet. Uh, but I don't see that happening in my lifetime. So we're, we're always looking, okay, what can we do as far as you know, maybe, you know, on, on general agriculture, you talk about stacking traits, right? So let's think right plant, right place, ideal soil conditions. And what can we do as being as, as efficient as possible as far as, um, uh, you know, irrigation uh, scheduling and irrigation application and, and making sure the water gets into the soil so that the plant can use it. But again, just a couple quick stats here. You know, these are uh, things that you can find readily available, you know, 30% of household water use is outdoor, you know, when you look at the annual use of um, uh, water. And that's, that's, that's a little deceiving because that also includes uh, people that maybe have a garden at home, right? And so if you're trying to grow your, you know, state fair squash or something, you're probably going to pour <laughs> the water to it. Or, or if you're in the giant pumpkin competition, you're not going to have a lack of water for that giant pumpkin. Uh, so there, this is a little misleading sometimes because the reality is, at least in my region, only about one in 10 lawns actually has an irrigation system. OK, yeah. uh, but the bottom line what this is kind of demonstrating is we do use a lot of water outside and, and, you, and you can do things like more water efficient um, um, heads for your shower. You can put in a toilet that maybe uses less water and you can turn off the water when you brush your teeth. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can conserve uh, in that way, but we also need to be paying attention to, you know, what can we do and how can we be more efficient with our water that we're applying to lawns and, uh, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Absolutely. I see that there are some, some people that are posting questions and, and whatnot. And I, I forgot to say it at the beginning, but um, keep posting questions either in the chat or in the, in the Q and a area. And at the end of the, uh, at the end of the show or at the end of the, um, when everybody's talking or everybody's done talking, we'll, we'll kind of go through and, and answer those questions a little bit. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of watching that myself. So if I see something <laughs> pop up here, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Absolutely. But again, you know, you know, a number of years ago, about seven or eight years ago, um, some folks came to me and we, we had a real, uh, a positive conversation, but the bottom line was, okay, what can we do for our localized region in the United States to try and develop some best management practices for existing and new construction so that, uh, you know, when development does occur, that we're being as efficient with those water resources as possible. And so I know we can do better and uh, we're, we're working towards that. Absolutely. This is one of the, this was probably one of the coolest things I think personally about visiting out and seeing your, uh, your turf grass research and diagnostic center. And, and you can see, we have one of our stations put there right in the smack dab in, uh, the, in, in the smack dab middle but uh, hearing you explain what it is that you're doing, I mean, you're essentially trying to starve the grass of water to see what, right. what cultivars are the, are the best, right? Right. As, as, as I mentioned, you know, I, I participate with a number of different groups that are uh, trying to, you know, uh, I, I call it the, the turf Papa John's principle. You know, if you're, if you're a pizza fan, you know, Papa John's has a tagline of, you know, better ingredients, better pizza, right? And so better turf, better ingredients. And all that starts with selecting the right cultivar and species for the uh, particular site and expected uh, intended use. And so one of the groups that uh, I've been cooperating with for almost 10 years now is the Turf Grass Water Conservation Alliance, which is a group of turf grass breeders that got together quite a while ago and said, a lot of the same kinds of things that I just said is, is we know that we can do better, but how do we try and make uh, the consumer more informed as far as uh, planting the right grasses? And so uh, there's, a, there's a program that qualifies new genetic material uh, throughout the United States and puts them under different types of uh, drought conditions. It could be acute drought, which is this situation where basically we bring everything to a hydrated status uh, and we uh, make sure everything's healthy and green. And then we shut off the water and just wait for everything to get down to 25% uh, or less green color. And as you can see, there are some squares in there that are certainly less than 25% green color. And then there are some that actually have a little bit more than that. And so once they get to that point, uh, we measure how long it takes for them to get to 25%. And then we also measure how long it takes for them to actually recover from that period. And the reason for that is that, uh, you know, public perception, public behavior is that in general, when things turn brown, they want to water them. So if we put grasses possibly into lawns, 
uh, that don't necessarily need to be watered as quickly, then we can sort of reduce people's sort of instinctive response to flip on the irrigation switch uh, in their lawns and possibly reduce the amount of water that's needed there. And so this is a qualification process. Not everybody, this is, this is, a, this is a lot like the NCAA tournament. You know, you got 64 teams and at the end, only a few are gonna make it to the final four, right? Absolutely. Um, so so this, this is something uh, again that I participate in and uh, it, it's quite interesting to see you know, some of the genetic material that our breeders are continually coming up with that are better than previous generations. Well, it's, it's just ridiculous. And it kind of ties everything back to, you know, I mean, even, you know, commercial agriculture, you're it's hybrid selection. You know, there, there's a reason certain hybrids have the drought guard label or the drought mm-hmm. tolerant label. And it's because they've gone through trials like this for, mm-hmm. for, for, uh, you know, corn and soybean farmers to place in those scenarios. So it's, uh, there's a lot more tie in between turf and I mean, look at, you know, look at corn, corn mm-hmm. is essentially a grass, right? So it is a grass. It's going to, it's going yep. yep. to act the same. It's going to go through the same process of identification and see which, which hybrids can potentially withstand the most, uh, the most drought stress. So it's really interesting work that you're doing. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, golf courses and, and, uh, sports turf. Right. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier, you know, the, the goals here are a little bit different uh, for the golfer. Uh, green isn't always good. You know, if it's, uh, I, I worked for some, you know, I, I spent some time in the golf industry prior to getting into academics. And, you know, one of the things that um, uh, one of my bosses at the time uh, had talked about is uh, he never, ever really, he never, ever wanted to intentionally have what was referred to as a green and gooey golf course, you know, green, the public perception is if it's green, it's healthy, right? Well, green grass isn't always the best grass to play on. And, and again, you can see we've got some pretty sophisticated irrigation systems for a lot of our golf courses uh, here in the United States that would you know, irrigate from rough to rough and you know, some control in between. Uh, but just because it's green doesn't mean that it's, it's a really playable golf course. You, know, you see a golf hole like that. Uh, this is a longer golf hole. It's actually one of our, our golf holes at, at the Purdue golf courses. And, you know, longer golf courses, you want to hit the ball off the tee and you want that ball to run. You don't want it to plug in the fairway. You don't want it to plug uh, on the uh, on the green. I mean, that's not a fun way to play golf. I mean, throwing darts at things, if you're one of the best players in the world, I mean, that's great. But I think mentally it's more fun when the ball sort of rolls places and, uh, you know, creates that interest and that excitement as far as you don't know where it's going to end up. So, so our golf get- course manager. Yeah. No, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to no. say, I don't know, Godfrey, as an avid golfer, is that, is that the funnest part of golf is, is <laughs> hit, hitting the, the shot of a lifetime and watching it just roll off the side of the green into a sand trap? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it makes it more interesting, right? I mean, yeah. um, but, it, but, it, but there's a turf health piece here as well. And I, I mentioned that earlier that, you know, over irrigated turf is much, much more dangerous than under irrigated turf to a certain extent. I mean, we're talking, you know, not death drought, but, you know, keeping things on the firmer and drier and, you know, a little brown around the edges isn't necessarily a bad thing. And, you know, if you get the right water happening at the right times and that resiliency piece, uh, you know, that can be a, a, a nice place to play. Oh, absolutely. And I know that, uh, and some of these slides here that are coming up, I, I was kind of looking through this and, and you see a lot of, uh, a lot of studies as far as selecting what is the right grass for that scenario, right? What is the right yeah. grass that can tolerate certain dress or certain stress tolerance or certain drought tolerance and, and still have that playability. So yeah, if you back what up, is it? if you back up briefly to the previous one, I, I just want to highlight that is, you know, that's a, that's a practice area on a golf course uh, in the Chicago land. And you can see sort of that modeled appearance there. That's uh, that was August of last year. And, you know, people would look at that and they, they would be like, well, is, is the, is the grass going to die uh, in our region? Probably not, but uh, you can see that's, that's a phenomenon called localized dry spot on, uh, on that, um, uh, on that chipping area for the, uh, for the practice green. And that is not uncommon to happen in sort of this July, August, September timeframe. And there are things like soil surfactants that can be applied to this to try and help that water penetrate down into there and be more efficiently applied uh, so that you're not having to apply, you can apply one, one inch of irrigation a week instead of needing two inches because you can't get the water to move down in there and you're wasting a lot of water. But uh, the ET rates, this is a period of, of very, very high evapotranspiration rates that cause some of this, uh, this, this situation to occur. So you can go back to the species now there, Derek. Yep. 
Um, so we did some things again, you know, right plant, right place. Uh, we had a study that we conducted under one of our rain out structures in 2018 and 2019, looking at uh, differences among things like Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, uh, colonial bent grass, creeping bent grass, some turf type tall fescues. And, and we're trying to identify the ones that um, needed to be watered more or less, uh, depending upon how long they held on to their green color. So if you move to the next slide there. Um, they kind were all of the before and after. <laughs> yep, exactly. So you can see how healthy they were to start. And if you look real carefully in the top right there, you can see my two dogs as my two yellow Labradors there doing a little field research with me. So, uh, mm -hmm. but you can see um, what we did with this is we were using a green color threshold where we would actually go out and image each of the plots uh, twice a week and determine whether or not we wanted to irrigate based on a percent green color there. And uh, we were start to, we were able to separate, separate out some different species uh, that, that needed more or less water. And um, it was, it, it was a really good study. It was a really good study. So. Absolutely. Well, I think like in a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, like the, the key thing is finding out the point in which, you know, your grass is still healthy and not water deficit. So I, you know, I know that, you know, you're using, uh, we've got a, a handful of stations out set up at your research facility with, with below ground sensors that are tracking evapotranspiration. So, I mean, what, what would you say the importance of, of, for a turf grass manager of incorporating technology into their, just another workflow, you know, some, another layer of double checking, what, what would you say the, the most important fact, factor would be for a turf grass manager when they're thinking about incorporating technology? Well, you know, you know, pretty much everybody has some sort of a mobile device in their pocket and, and they can go to, you know, pick your little weather service that you like. And, and, and that's fine. And it, you know, it, you know, I have one on my phone, it's weather bug. It came with the phone and, you know, I have West Lafayette programmed in there and it tells me kind of high temperatures, low temperatures, and, you know, it gives me a little bit of a five or a 10 day forecast and, and that's fine. But uh, having a station on site that then you can kind of go back to and sort of ground truth, you know, what you're you're seeing for the the general area is is really really helpful and um, you know we have like you said like you mentioned we have several of these now uh, at our um, at our research station and, and this one right here uh, is located in a very very exposed area so it's giving me an idea of you know something that would be very very you know maximum ET and maximum environmental you know stressful environmental conditions for the day and then we have some other ones that are more shaded conditions. And, and what I'm trying to gather from this is, you know, this, this sort of spectrum of differences, <clears throat> because ultimately what would be nice is to be able to have, you know, something where a turf grass manager could put in information as far as what their recent irrigation schedule was, you know, what their expectations are for, uh, you know, turf grass greenness, turf grass quality, uh, maybe even some sort of soil moisture in there. And they can get a sense for, okay, you know, typically I'm on a mentally programmatic approach to irrigation, but then this gives them sort of, you know, sort of a thumbs up or thumbs down of, you know, hey, this supports what I think that I need to do, or this, you know, it, it's telling me that, hey, uh, there's actually more water in there than I thought there was, and maybe I can wait another day. And if, and if you could save thousands of gallons, you know, a week on a golf course, that's a big deal. And, uh, for, oh, for lots, lots absolutely. Absolutely. It saves on manpower. It saves on resources. And I think that's kind of the whole end goal of, of, you know, what we try to do or what we try to focus on at, at, at Meadows is let's, let's just be efficient with the resources that we have. And, and whether that's people, whether that's, uh, you know, equipment, whether that's water and, and try and put things in the right place at the right time. So, um, I, I, I have one thing that I want to do before I, before I switch over to Godfrey. And the only reason if anybody's, uh, you know, Kale has been a guest on my podcast in the past. And one of the things that I still get comments on to this day, I mean, our, our show was a couple of months ago is we had a, about a half hour at the end of the show where we talked about, I, or I basically just had Kale debunk, uh, myths about turf grass and well, we won't spend a whole lot of time on it right now, but I do have just a couple of them that I wanted to, to throw back at you. Okay. And uh, one before, one of the before, like we the before we dive into that, I just want to one last thing on the weather station here. I think sure. the other the other the other important factor is uh, I think they're really really helpful 
in terms of somebody's pest management program too, right? And we didn't go real deep into this, but that is something we're exploring too is, you know, we do have a weed scientist, we do have an entomologist and we, uh, you know, have a pathology program here at Purdue and, and, and this weather piece can really be a good decision uh, making tool for the turf grass manager in addition to irrigation. So don't oh, discount that. Oh, absolutely. And I think that Godfrey kind of covers some of that uh, in yep. some real life use cases that he's uh, actually been the one to go out and do the installations of uh, kind of throughout Europe. So um, I've only got a couple of them here for you. So we'll, we'll go through okay. them here real quick. So first myth of uh, turf grass, you can water any, at any time of day. Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. Our, our typical textbook answer is, is based around trying to be as efficient as possible. You can water any time of day, but in general, uh, our recommendations are that you should irrigate on the earlier side of the day for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is generally irrigation systems tend to be a little bit more efficient because there's not as much wind and there's better water pressure in the lines. Uh, but the other aspect of that is you always want to be minimizing uh, opportunities for long, long periods of leaf wetness, particularly in the evening hours in the summertime because that could be a recipe for diseases. So you can water any time of day, but you know, if you want to be most efficient, uh, early morning hours, 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. tend to be best. Excellent. It's best to water your lawn every day. That's another huge, it depends. And um, I would say that, again, sort of our rule of thumb there is in general, you want to do what we call deep and infrequent irrigation. So for a lawn, it might be two to three times a week, right? But that's one type of system. When you think about something like if, you, if, you're, if you're using the, the method a golf course manager might use for irrigating your lawn, those are two different systems. You know, think about a golf green. Golf greens maintained at sometimes a tenth of an inch or even less. Your lawn's being maintained at three inches. So your root systems can be dramatically different. So deep and infrequent for the lawn system is different than deep and infrequent for the turf grass that's being grown on a golf course putting green. So in general lawns, two to three times a week, golf greens, they might try and do two to three times a week at certain times of the year, but then this time of year, late July, early August, they may need to do daily irrigation. And I think Godfrey will touch on that with some of the below ground yep. sensors that, that go into the greens and whatnot. So I'm just going to do one more here for you. And I'm not sure if this is a myth or not, uh, but I see all these, it's almost like a viral trend on social media where you see these people going out and they're dumping grass seed into like a five gallon bucket and then mixing in toilet paper and then mixing in water and just stirring it all up and then using that to to kind of plug in some bare spots around the around your yard or around your sports field or on your golf course is that a good idea so what i think somebody is trying to accomplish with that and i'll have to try and find the tiktok for this or you know wherever you oh i'll send it to you i i'm i I follow i follow uh lawn talk or turf talk pretty pretty closely so okay i'm gonna gonna have to i'm gonna have to (laughs) dig deeper into that i got that have my daughter help me dig into that one but uh i think that what they're trying to accomplish is um uh it's it's a turf hack uh, for trying to essentially create like a hydro seeding mix, right? And so hydro seeding, it's not uncommon for professional hydro seeders to have some component of recycled newspaper or something like that that's in there that's used as what we call a tackifier. It basically allows that seed plus that slurry of, of the newspaper to stick. And then that paper is intended to uh, be a little bit of a mulch for the, uh, uh, for the germinating seedlings. I could see it working, Derek, but, you know, uh, I, I would be very, very careful the type of toilet paper that I would use. I, I might have to, you know, do a couple tests because the, the, the cheap scratchy stuff could just create a big mess. Um, if you really, really wanted to do, do this, um, there are some nice products at garden centers that you could purchase. And then you get a high quality seed, like I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, mix that with some of these uh, higher quality um, uh, mulch materials. And I, I would actually prefer that. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for kind of telling us a little bit about the research that you're doing, some of the stuff that you're, uh, you're trying to figure out and, and how you're incorporating the tech into it. Uh, Godfrey, let's switch over to you. Um, you know, we've heard again, some of the research and the applications on that side for, uh, for the meadow system. And now, uh, I know that you've been personally uh, involved with a lot of things, uh, on the, uh, you know, on the golf course side. So I want to dig a little bit deeper into you and I might actually, it looks like you're in presentation mode. Um, I wonder if you can make this full screen. Can you see it? Okay. Let me just check if it's working. Uh, it's working, but it's, uh, it's showing, um, 
it's showing like uh, the 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 boards on the side. Is there a yeah, let me check here? Full screen mode. Full screen mode. Why is it going to see here? No. Uh, 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 okay, let me check here. Okay, now let me see here. Full screen mode. No, it's there. Still not there. Um, you know what? This will work just fine. Okay, good. So, uh, Kate, it was great to hear what you do in, in your research. And I think uh, a lot of things which, which you said, we, we try to, to implement here in, uh, in, 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 in what we do in PESTL with, uh, with our turf uh, and, uh, and golf course line. What I try to do here is uh, uh, to, to, to give you a little bit of, a, uh, let's say, an insight of uh, what we do and uh, what kind of hard and software we have. And, and how, uh, let's say, it's used in, in, in a really uh, practical use case. Um, what uh, uh, we have been always doing also in, the, in our agriculture, um, let's say, business cases, uh, we, we look at this in a more holistic way. Now, IoT and Internet of Things, of course, now is already uh, used in, in many, many applications. But what we do in PESL instruments, and my team does, is we look into not only, let's say, in the weather stations where we are most, uh, let's say, known for, we are also uh, developed over the last uh, eight, 10 years, basically, also other products which are fully integrated into uh, uh, field climate. And now in the golf uh, uh, segment, we call it turfclimate.com. And so we do basically a combination of uh, in situ monitoring combined with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, spot readings and uh, solutions which we get from the satellite. Uh, so of course, uh, if you see here on the left side, we see the weather station, the irrigation management, the monitoring of soil moisture. We do also insect monitoring as Kale said, but that's also getting uh, more and more of a, let's say an, an issue on golf courses because uh, we have got different, uh, uh, let's say new species entering the golf course. Uh, which also uh, can create uh, specific problems. Then, of course, a big issue and a big uh, demand nowadays is the turf course uh, disease management, forecasting of diseases. Uh, then, of course, the most important thing, because that's the, the golf course all about, is the playing conditions, the best playing conditions. And I'm, an, I'm a very bad golfer, so I need very, 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 very uh, dry greens and so forth that I, my, my, my drive is, is going as far as possible. Then of course, uh, another thing is very important for the, for the managers of the golf course is also to, uh, to schedule the opening and closing hours of the golf course. So to see when the playing conditions are not good so that they have to shut down the golf course. For example, uh, frost events in the spring or in, in, the, in the autumn. Uh, and of course, on the right hand side of this graph, you can see that the nutrition management, which is a, important, the asset tracking, how many hours uh, you are mowing and uh, how many, when is the next service interval of the, of the device. And of course, also in some golf courses, it's also managing the lakes, uh, managing the, the water reservoirs and also uh, other things like uh, topsoil mapping, understanding where you have uh, issues with the drainage and, and, uh, and this you can see also from, from, this, from uh, using a, a scanner on the, on the golf course and combine this uh, potentially with satellite images and so forth. And last but not least, every golf course nowadays have a fully automatic irrigation system, but most of these irrigation systems are not really, uh, uh, let's say, uh, integrated with sensors. So uh, here you can see uh, a synthesis of, of our uh, devices. Basically, uh, we have uh, uh, the in-situ weather stations. And I can tell you, we are in that golf course market since uh, 1992. So many of the golf courses, they have already weather stations. They, they are using that for many years. But I think we have some technology which goes into the next layer of, of, a, of a golf course management. So you have local uh, me measurement of the soil moisture, 
local measurement of the rainfall data and the evapotranspiration data, as Kale said. That's something which, which is a new trend. Uh, and also you can then manage your, your 18 holes or your, your, your nine holes in, in a much more, let's say, a personal way. And I'd say not every green needs the same uh, amount of water and, uh, uh, and so forth, because it's exposed in a different way. Then, of course, uh, uh, the other thing in, in, in this is uh, 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 it needs to be uh, uh, in, in, in the way that you have your, 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 your mobile application. So everything nowadays goes on mobile. But of course, also uh, in the mobile application, you don't see everything so clear. So you, you need to have also sometimes uh, uh, time to look into more detail than you, you use the, the desktop version. So. Uh, the problems, I think I, I can skip here quite uh, fast through it uh, because uh, Kale touched it already very much in detail. So, uh, but what I want to see here is uh, also is the record, the record keeping. The record keeping is so you can manage this uh, better and say, okay, look, I have, I have had this problem because uh, we had this heavy rainfall. And uh, this created that kind of problem. And uh, because we had, uh, 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 we had uh, uh, water standing there for one day or two days, and this created that particular problem. So also for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the superintendent uh, to, to have a, a reference to his managers that this was not his, his laziness or his problem, or it was a, a problem which created uh, uh, the environmental conditions. Then of course, uh, 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 we need to see uh, the soil moisture is getting more and more important. And, and uh, um, as we are uh, thinking about, or we thought about what is a, a good way of, of making permanent soil moisture sensors available to, uh, on, on the green and having a low cost solution, we came up with a, with a product, we call it Minimetos. And the mini metals you can really uh, insert in, let's say, in less than 10 minutes into a green and mount it inside a, a, an irrigation box. And uh, after 50 minutes, you don't see the, the unit anymore. And this unit is then permanently monitoring uh, uh, the green conditions. And in combination with, uh, with uh, uh, spot readings, you can better understand or what is going on on the, uh, let's say, on that particular green. And also if you do hand watering, you can see much better uh, uh, where you can irrigate or where you need to irrigate, where are your dry spots and where you, need, you don't need to irrigate. And, uh, and I think uh, very important is uh, that we can see uh, and forecast very precisely with uh, uh, the weather station measuring the temperature, humidity, the rainfall, the soil temperature, the leaf wetness or the turf wetness, uh, very precisely uh, the major diseases, which is pitium, dollar spot, brown patch, uh, and also snow mold in, in some of the areas like in, in Central Europe, uh, we have quite a number of problems on that. Uh, Kate came up also with the, with the problems of best. We have developed uh, a, a, an automatic pest trap. So basically the unit is, uh, is uh, uh, equipped with a camera inside uh, that, that, that box here. And uh, with some, uh, uh, um, let's say attractants, which, can, which are basically pheromones, we attract only a, sort, a, sort, uh, a certain species of, of, of insects. We catch them, we picture them, and then uh, uh, you can see uh, what is the problem and how, how much uh, uh, insects are coming in, and then you can react accordingly. And only use insecticides when there is a pressure and don't use it when there's no need for it. Then I think uh, also on the light of, uh, of environmental pressure, and of course some of the golf courses are close to uh, to housing, spray drift, and, uh, and uh, the use of pesticides uh, in the right timing. We had heard about irrigation, it's best in the morning when there's no wind. The same is also for, for uh, plant protection and for spraying. So you, you understand when there is, uh, uh, and also for record keeping, uh, you can see here on the, on the picture uh, lower to the, to the sprayer, when you did that and what was the speed and, and, uh, and what was the wind conditions during that. 
asset management uh, on the golf course is, is critically important because you understand uh, uh, when you need to go to, to bring your, your, your machine to the service, when you need to clean it, uh, and all these things are, are, are important. And with automatic tracking, you know where the unit uh, at the moment is working, how many hours did you do, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, the spot reading devices are, are pretty new for us, and, uh, uh, and we found it it very let's say complementary to our let's say permanent monitoring systems. We have uh, uh, the the soil the soil guard, uh, which is a permanently uh, or let's say it's a spot reading device. You can walk around with a GPS with a display, and you can see immediately the soil moisture. This is tracked and automatically transmitted into field climate, and from there you can uh, get the data and uh, see what, uh, what's, what's needed and where you need to irrigate. Similar is also a, a device called Dualix. You measure uh, uh, the, the grass and you can see uh, uh, what is the, the nitrate level in your, this particular area. And of course, then apply fertilizer uh, based on that. Pretty new is, is, is our, let's say, satellite images, uh, which are coming from the European Space Agency satellite called Sentinel-2. And this allows you to give you in a resolution of 10 by 10 meters, the, the, the leaf area index indexes and also other indexes like the NDVI. So you understand where is your, your grass growing and where it's not growing and so forth. And uh, then on, on the nutrition side, we also have uh, uh, developed uh, a new device, which is called the Mobilab. And this can also uh, be used to, 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 to analyze your soil, your soil, uh, more other the soil, uh, let's say nutrition. You can with the same device. You can also analyze your water. So if you use, uh, let's say, uh, uh, water from, let's say, from a sewage plant which is uh, has been cleaned, uh, you can also see how much nitrate is in that uh, water already there. So you you don't need to apply additional fertilizer when you apply already uh, fertilizer with your uh, water. Uh, with your irrigation water. And this is very interesting. And also you can, you can do the SAP analytics with the same device. And, uh, and this is something where, uh, which should become, uh, let's say, of a device which could be on every golf course so that you don't need to send your samples uh, into, the, uh, into the, the lab. So you can do it right away. You take your samples, you take your grass cuts, and uh, 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 an hour later, when you when you have uh, brought your your grass into into the uh, uh, into the office, you know already what's going on in terms of uh, nitrate and other uh, 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 fertilizer needs. Uh, I'm just now going into a, let's say a small use case uh, which we have done uh, this year in uh, in Germany with uh, a very known company in the golf course industry. Sommerfeld AG, and uh, they are working uh, in Germany with uh, a number of golf courses, over 50 they manage under, uh, under their uh, umbrella. So they do everything from uh, uh, reconstruction, uh, maintenance, and of course, all the, the irrigation and, and mowing and so forth. But the problems uh, in, in all over the, let's say, Europe after and during the pandemic is, of course, uh, that people uh, are not, uh, let's say, willing to work uh, maybe on, on a golf course because they, they got more money from the government uh, staying at home uh, or, uh, let's say, work outside is not, is not very attractive. So it's very difficult to find employees for them. So the more they can see from the outside and also the more they can, they can plan ahead of time, the better it is for the, for the, for the, uh, the company. And also uh, uh, in, the, in the last year and a half, uh, the golf courses also got flooded much, much more than in the past. Uh, people could uh, not travel and more, more people were playing on the golf course on the local golf course, which is good for the golf, for the, for the, for the, for the pocket and uh, for the wallet of the golf course. But on course, it's not so good for the golf course itself because instead of having uh, 200 players, you have 300 players on the course, and that means a lot of stress for the for the for the um, uh, for the course. And uh, so, what we did uh, uh, and we do with with Sommerfeld, of course, we understand now better 
what uh, we can do. And for example, uh, in this picture here, we have done a, a, a BOC on a, on a golf course in Northern Germany. Uh, it's an 18 hole course. Uh, we have deployed uh, uh, six mini metals, uh, which are in on three greens and on three fairways and uh, one full uh, fully equipped 3.3 IMATOS uh, weather station, which has uh, wind speed and soil temperature and soil moisture. And based on this information, combined with the localized weather forecast, uh, we can, we can uh, see uh, the disease risk uh, and when uh, uh, you need to apply, let's say, pesticides and much more accurate. You can see here, uh, you see the data, you see the, the, uh, the rainfall data, you see the risk indices uh, on, on that local uh, uh, fields or local uh, uh, greens. And you, you only apply uh, the pesticides uh, or the fungicide when it's really uh, uh, needed. For example, here in this case, we see that uh, this was uh, in, the, in the beginning of the season, around uh, 5th of April till the 19th of April. There was quite a, a wet period. Uh, the temperature was still quite low. So you, you had a, an outbreak or a, dis, on a risk uh, of, of snow mold. And speaking to the superintendent from that course, it was really uh, uh, the, fate, the, the case. And so they, they were reacting accordingly and that they have had uh, uh, little problems. In also in, in this case, in, in, and also in, in, in the uh, management of a golf course, we're talking about uh, years of data, which makes the greenkeeper, let's say the data useful to them. No? For example, in this year, uh, we had a very wet spring. Uh, it was, the temperature was very low for a long time. And all of a sudden, uh, beginning, let's say mid of May, all of a sudden you can see this also here uh, on, the, on the soil temperature on the lower side here, all of a sudden the temperature, the soil temperature was growing, was creeping up quite steeply. But uh, in the beginning of the year in May, you see the soil temperature was still around nine degrees. So it was very low gro uh, growth and, uh, and, and, and so forth. So for the greenkeeper and for the, for the manager to see all this data, it's, 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 it's gold, I would say. Then uh, 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 coming to the, to the soil moisture, here you can see uh, uh, the, 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 the data from uh, the, the two systems, the Minimetos in that uh, fairway 14 and the green 14, you can see here uh, the soil moisture is, let's say uh, in this year it was quite wet, but there was a period around, let's say uh, uh, around the 14th to the 21st of June there was quite, uh, let's say, some, and, and it was heavy growth, long days in Germany. And that time, you have something like uh, a light between uh, uh, four o'clock in the morning till about 10 o'clock in the evening. So it's long growing, con growing conditions. And you can see the lawn was using a lot of, uh, 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 let's say, moisture. And, and this information is, is very valuable for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the super and then to understand uh, what is when is the best time to 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 refill uh, the, the the grass uh, with 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 water? Not not to interrupt you there, and yeah. and to go back to that previous slide. That's also pretty useful. I mean, Kale had mentioned that uh, one of the biggest things that you know a superintendent would look for, especially on a green is making sure it's kind of right on the cusp of being too dry, so that ball is really going to roll. So when they you you get a few months of information like this in. And you're almost able, yeah, exactly where your mouse is there. You're, yeah, you're yeah. almost able to, to kind of predict, um, you know, when you can take a day off, when, you know, exactly when needs to be irrigated to keep that, uh, that green consistent throughout the entire growing season, throughout the entire playing season. Yeah, it was interesting also that we speak, we spoke to the, to the, to the superintendent there and he was quite, uh, let's say, sometimes a little bit shocked how, how, how long he can wait uh, until he can irrigate again, because in his in his uh, uh, perception, he needed to irrigate much more. Because, uh, uh, but you see that that you can see having the sense of permanently there. And what you do then 
is you walk out then with the with the soil guard and and measure also the other points of the of the of the, of the greens and then you can see okay i i have here a a, a, a dry spot or uh, the other spots are, uh, of the green are not uh, are not so dry so i can only hand water or only irrigate uh, a part of it no so these are these are the, the 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 absolute important things but on that other side for for the golf course and that's also is always the workforce and the workforce planning for the crews when they when you mentioned it when the guys can have a day off or or not no so this is this is something which the weather forecast and the information with the permanent uh, devices i can i can i can much better schedule that and uh, and I can say, okay, you you can have uh, two days off, and uh, and you come back, and then you, you, the work you can do the, the work what what needs to be done. So and last but not least, of course, you can also see uh, from the satellite information other things which you would never see from the from the ground. And for example, here uh, you can see here, which was which, which is very unusual here on the 7th of April in Northern Germany, all of a sudden you got snow. So you see here, all of a sudden you had good uh, growing season start uh, on, the on the 25th of, of, of March, but all of a sudden you would probably forget that uh, uh, when, you, you, when you look in two years time, what happened on that, on, that, uh, uh, on that spot. And of course also you can see here, for example, here on that picture, you can see here some wet spots and this might be uh, some drainage issues, and later on you might say, "Okay, here we need to do something on on the on on construction in order to avoid this this kind of of, of problems." So, I would say uh, the preliminary results on that are very very encouraging. Uh, we can say uh, uh, the guy the guy said the data is reliable. It's very useful. It it uh, it it helps them a lot with the with the with the with the planning with the actual and future activities and of course it takes a lot of guesswork out of that and avoids of course costly errors because uh, uh, you know uh, 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 there's lots of green keepers who have been fired when the a green was lost no <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and and that's that's something uh, uh, which which is which is very uh, painful for everybody uh, and uh, and then of course you have the full traceability. No, uh, you can you can say to the president of the golf course or to the manager uh, in in the in the office. So we have to close the golf course because it's it's frost on that on that area. No, or we have to it's too wet on that area. So they already know ahead of time because there's nobody needs to go out there uh, if they have to close or open the golf course uh, timely. And. Last but not least, I think uh, it's very important to, to do this watering very responsibly, uh, very, let's say, uh, uh, based on the need of the crop uh, and, and the need of the grass. And which is also very important is to see how often I need to, to mow my, my grass. And if I can uh, uh, spread that cycle, I can save a lot of money. That's uh, definitely the case. No? So. Uh, I would say that's more or less uh, my, I'm already time-wise, I'm two minutes before the end. So I try to <laughs> be fast. Uh, if there is any questions, I, I have here a picture of a friend of mine, which I know for, from the 1992. And uh, when Dan and I met the first time, uh, he's the superintendent of, 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 an, of a very important golf course in, in Chicago. Uh, he was using our station, uh, and that was not there was no internet at that time. But he already used the station at that time, and uh, said that's something every greenkeeper or every superintendent needs to have. And I would say the next step is more uh, to have this holistic approach, where you 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 can have this everything. Let's say having talk to each other, and 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 so you can have a. Uh, 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 and many stakeholders can work together. Not only that the, the, the superintendent has this data, we can also have this data available, make available for the players, for example, which I which I think we're gonna do the first time next year on my golf course where I'm playing. So. And and that's a really good point, Gottfried. And like the the thing to really realize about all of these tools and all of these solutions is you know, none of this is meant to replace anybody on the golf course. This is meant to just it's meant to help everybody make better decisions. It's meant to help you allocate your resources in a more efficient and a smarter way. So 
you know, like in this example here, uh, you know, you weigh the cost of, of uh, a potential application of, you know, in this case, it was a fungicide, you know, can be as high as $6,000. But, uh, you know, if your station is saying either, yes, you need this or no, you don't need this or, or whatever the case may be, if, if you, you're, you're able to realize return on investment based off of the actionable decisions that you're receiving from these, uh, from these tools out in the field. So what our, our goal is, I think, and, and it, it doesn't matter if this is a residential lawn, if this is a research facility, if this is uh, a sports or a golf field, it's just to be more efficient with what we're doing and to have a, a better understanding of when is the right time to do things so that we uh, you know, can continually have healthy grass throughout the season. We can continually have uh, a good, uh, accurate playing surface throughout the season. So um, thank you, Godfrey, for, for kind of breaking that down for us and, and going through all of the different use cases and some of the things that you've been involved with. Um, we had a couple of questions and I know Kale, uh, I appreciate you've been, uh, kind of answering them and, and just real quick before we get done, I, I want to just let them out there so that everybody can hear them. So, uh, Kale, if you wouldn't mind, um, just kind of elaborating on some of the answers that you've given. So the first question was, uh, do grass varieties have different root depths? Uh, yes, uh, I mentioned that in the, in the um, response there, but, you know, in general, lawn grass might uh, seasonally have something in that six to 10 inches, uh, but there are some grasses like some of our fescues, the turf type tall fescues that might be 18 inches or even slightly more. And, and again, that's going to affect the irrigation needs. Uh, what about the use of EO satellites or radar images to define the irrigation needs for turf? Um, that is something that we're seeing on the professional turf management side of things. I'm seeing some folks that are uh, on, the, on the golf course uh, situations that are using those and even having, uh, you know, an individual drone that might be flying a, above a, a, a particular site. Uh, I, bl <coughs> I believe Gottfried mentioned, uh, you know, you have some things with the Sentinel too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, yep. that's, uh, that's some information. So that might even answer one of the other questions, but it, it is something yeah. that can be used, but it's, um, uh, the data is not as easy. It's not as publicly easy to access without have some sort of subscription to things. And it's something, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely something that we, we wanted to include with turf view because it yep. is important and, and it's not just important for, you know, identifying spots, but, you know, as Godfrey mentioned, one of the big things is uh, where is a potential construction project potentially needed? Uh, you know, where do we have a drainage issue? Where do we need to allocate some funds to, to really fix a problem before it becomes a bigger problem? Um, and then lastly for you, Kale, what is the impact of slopes on irrigation needs in golf turf? Uh, yes, and I responded to that one too. Slope obviously plays a very big role and, and water flows downhill because of that gravity thing. Um, but in general, you know, slopes uh, need to be uh, considered. They need to be irrigated slightly different. Uh, you know, on a golf course type of situation where you have, uh, you know, bunker banks or real severe slopes because of some sort of feature that's been constructed. Uh, one potential option for irrigating those is uh, there are some of my colleagues in the desert Southwest that have had some decent success uh, with these sub irrigation types of um, irrigation systems where essentially they put tubing beneath the root zone about eight inches deep and they sort of pulse the water into that rather than applying the water to the uh, surface and having it run off. So there are some options there. They're not perfect, uh, but there are some ways to be more efficient with using water on those slopes. Absolutely. Um, I think Godfrey, a couple of, you know, questions. I know we answered one, which kind of satellite images are, are we using? We're using Sentinel-2 from the European Space Agency. And then the other one uh, for you, Godfrey, is uh, in regard to uh, evapotranspiration, can the field measurements uh, from your stations measure the air temperature and humidity at 10 centimeters above soil level? Absolutely. There's no problem to do that. We can measure it on, on the, let's say, on the, on the 10 centimeter level. But also, of course, for the evapotranspiration, you normally need uh, it about at one meter eighty uh, temperature and humidity, wind speed and wind direct wind speed and uh, radiation. But uh, that's something which is very frequently used uh, on the temperature. I think one of the slides uh, on the golf course. I think in the beginning you saw uh, there was two temperature sensors: one at the standard heights for the air temperature and uh, one temperature on the let's say grass level. And of course, in most cases, we recommend to use also the soil temperature, uh, the temperature on the grass, let's say 
four or five centimeters below the grass. Uh, and this gives you a, a, a very good indication about the stress level of, of, the, of the dirt. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and you know, we, can, we have a, a multitude of different uh, stations and different configurations that can be set up in, in, in really whatever manner that you're, you're looking to record. So uh, with that, I think that that kind of concludes the questions we had in the chat. So this, uh, all this publication will be, or this broadcast will be available um, both on YouTube to see the actual thing. I'm also going to release the audio version on, on the podcast, United We Ag, which is, you know, uh, through Meadows USA. Kale Godfrey, thank you so much for your time today. I know it's a busy time of year. Uh, it's, a, it's a stressful time of year. Everybody's trying to, to manage these things is before they get too out of control. And, and you know, Kale, again, thank you. You've been, he's been answering my calls uh, just for uh, random questions I'm having with my grass in my yard. So uh, you're both a, a, a very great resource to us, and, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, and have a good night. Bye-bye. Yep. Everybody enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, be safe and, and we'll see you next month. All right. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Thanks. Godfrey. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Bye. Bye.